Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Corey, Education Specialist for WorldLink Medical, and I will be moderating today's event. I would like to mention a few quick items before we begin. First of all, please make note of the features available to you within your GoToWebinar internet browser in the lower right hand corner of your screen so you can see the chat box where you can enter questions. They will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. This web conference is brought to you by WorldLink Medical. We provide evidence-based CME accredited education in wellness medicine. If you desire a small practice doing BHRT only, or a medium-sized wellness practice, or a large multi-specialty integrated practice, don't miss the debut of the business of creating health, which will provide the knowledge to make an informed decision of the model that best suits your specific needs. Meet with like-minded colleagues and our faculty team of experts, and create an actionable plan to move you in the direction you want to go. This is truly a unique opportunity for a one-of-a-kind course. Don't miss out. See our website for details. We are also going to be offering um, a Beyond Hormones course um, in October. That will be coming up um, on the website. Today's event is sponsored by an educational grant from MedQuest Pharmacy. We are grateful for their continued support in recognizing the importance of patient and presenter education in the field of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. They are truly leaders in the industry and we are proud to be supported by them. Today we have a guest speaker, Dr. Rob Komenarek. He is board certified fellow of the American College of Osteopathic Family Physicians. Dr. Rob is a graduate of Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medicine in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He completed his residency training at Ohio State University, Grandview Hospital, and Medical Center in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Rob is a medical advisor and director to emergency medical services, police departments, and radio and television shows across the country. Dr. Rob is a veteran of the United States Army and is a best-selling author with a passion directed towards overall health of the mind and body through proper eating habits, regular exercise, appropriate supplementation, and the intelligent optimization of hormones when clinically indicated. Please welcome Dr. Rob Komenarek. Good well, afternoon, thank you very Rob. For that. Good afternoon, and thank you for that introduction. But most importantly, I am a Utah ski bum above all other things. Um, and But today I'm coming to you uh, from the tropical paradise of southwestern Ohio. Um, it's not the typical uh, environment like uh, Neil is used to lecturing from in Palm Springs, but we, we are having some nice weather, which is which is good for this time of the year. So... Let's get down to the subject that we're talking about, which we've all probably encountered at some point, which is the crazy things that can happen when you give hormones, and in particular, testosterone. And I'll share with you a little bit of my story of how I ended up delivering hormones. And it really goes back to 1998 when I was finishing up my residency in uh, family medicine and started an emergency medicine residency, and uh, was opening up an urgent care. And the day I opened up an urgent care, this fella was coming by on his motorcycle, and he T-boned a car and skipped off the A-pillar of the car. And we ran out, took care of him, and sent him off to the hospital. Well, he showed back up in my urgent care about three months later, minus testicles from the accident. Well, back in residency, and you probably was, many of you remember, we spent like three, four months discussing female reproductive systems and all the diseases, and about five minutes talking about male reproductive system. And, and if you look in Harrison's, there's a paragraph in there about male reproductive systems and, and what you do. Uh, so I found myself kind of in a quandary. You know, it's 1998, and um, what, what do I do with this guy? What, what's his problem? So, you know, I call a urologist and say, hey, you know, you took this guy's testicles out from that trauma surgery. Um, 
you're going to start him on testosterone? And he goes, oh, I don't do that. Send him to an endocrinologist. So I call an endocrinologist and he says, hey, uh, yeah, 200 milligrams IM every two weeks. Hangs up the phone on me. And that's where I started. So back in 1998, that was my first time delivering testosterone to somebody, and I really had no clue what I was doing. And he went kind of through the typical cycles. He kind of got better, then he kind of got worse. He kind of got better, he kind of got worse. Then three, four months into it, he just got worse. Nothing seemed to work. And at, in 1998, there really just wasn't a lot of resources uh, to, to use to figure out, well, what, what, are, what kind of problems is this guy having, and how can I fix it? So I went to the experts at that time, which would be the bodybuilders in our community, and I knew of a fellow who was using testosterone. So I went to these men and I said, well, how are you using this stuff? How are you not having these problems that I'm seeing happening with uh, you know, this individual? And they were just taking massive doses of steroids. But it, it all, that's how this all started for me back in 1998 was this one patient. And 20 some years later, I would be here uh, on a webinar talking about the crazy things that can happen when you give testosterone to men. And then what you can do to correct those problems and how do you, how do you get out of these things? And is there any way to look at this and go, could I know that this is going to happen before I start these hormones? So some of the crazy things that we can see happen, and, and these are not guaranteed to happen in every individual, but when you go to deliver testosterone to a man or woman, these should be in the back of your mind as things that could occur or do occur and could lead to problems. Top of the list is the increase in serotonin reuptake transporter protein, and we'll talk in depth on that one. Uh, the depletion of magnesium that occurs uh, and can occur when you deliver testosterone. Monoamine oxidase, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, and panic attacks. The almost uh, predictable depletion of uh, pregnenolone and depletion of DHEA. And then what can you do to back out of this mess when everything goes crazy? So we've all probably seen this slide before. Complex then enters the nucleus, and we have the activation of the messenger RNA and transcription. And while someone can have a decent level, they can still have all the symptoms of deficient hormones. So hormone, the effectiveness of those hormones are dependent on the hormone being able to bind to the protein, the receptor site sensitivity, is there signal transduction, and that hormone receptor complex binding to the receptor sites on that chromatin, uh, activating that messenger RNA for transcription. Hormones work on those nuclear receptors uh, with resultant gene activity and protein synthesis. Uh, they are not precise and they have broad effects on multiple tissues that are dependent upon receptor uh, density, which is why on some individuals you'll have certain effects and other ones different ones. And these hormones can have a myriad of unwanted or unintended side effects because of this. So, We've seen this one slide before, the uh, synaptic cleft, the synapse of the nerves. And on this slide, if you focus on the right-hand side of it, you can see where that serotonin transporter protein, the CERT, the serotonin reuptake transporter protein, when you deliver testosterone, you will increase the uptake of serotonin out of the synaptic cleft. That increase of that serotonin being pulled out of there can lead to issues uh, not long after you administer testosterone to certain individuals. Uh, we know from studies that sex hormones modulate serotonergic transmission, uh, that hormones do change the levels of regional serotonin reuptake transport or binding potential, uh, that serotonin reuptake transport uh, protein uh, is much uh, increased in the amygdala, the caudate putamen, and, and the uh, median raphe nucleus, and that androgens can stimulate uh, serotonin-related gene expression by up-regulating 
uh, serotonin reuptake transporter uh, protein and depleting those synaptic clefts uh, of serotonin, which can lead to uh, some really disturbing uh, issues, especially when it comes to panic attacks. Uh, androgens increase that binding of the serotonin transporter protein. Remember that uh, the serotonin transporter protein is a type of monoamine transporter that transports serotonin from the synaptic cleft back to the presynaptic neuron, and the transport of this serotonin by cert terminates the action of serotonin and then recycles it. And there have been numerous studies that have shown that uh, androgens, along with problems with alcoholism, depression, uh, compulsive disorders, uh, hormone replacement, hypertension, and social uh, disorders can uh, elicit changes in the up uptake protein. So one of the things that you should remember that when you deliver testosterone to any individual, man or woman, is that there is the potential for increasing the reuptake of the serotonin transporter protein which can lead to nervousness, anxiousness, uh, panic, panic attacks, uh, and you need to be aware of that uh, potential. Now, the depletion of magnesium, and let's see if I can find, here's the slide I want you to see. So we're all familiar with <clears throat> cholesterol being converted into pregnenolone, and the three different arms of these pathways. You have the aldosterone arm to the left, the cortisol arm down the middle, and then off to the right, the androgen arm. Well, the final step in the conversion of, of adenyl cyclase into 3,5-cyclic AMP is a magnesium-dependent process. So it is possible when you deliver testosterone and to, in an individual that already is mildly deficient in magnesium to deplete that magnesium even further. So let's remember that that final step is a magnesium-dependent process and there are many individuals that even before you deliver testosterone are already deficient in, in uh, magnesium to begin with. Somewhere around 60% of the population is deficient because their nutrient sources are not uh, uh, and their eating habits are not appropriate and do not supply them with the required nutrients. Often, many times when I place individuals on uh, testosterone, one of the things that I do beforehand is a uh, nutrient level and I like intracellular nutrient levels um, I have one slide here and this one's from a spectra cell report and you can see here that this individual was intracellularly depleted of magnesium and almost predictably uh, he kind of argued with me a little bit he didn't want to take magnesium because he's like well I, I really don't think I need that but after a couple of weeks of being on testosterone he started to display that agitation and irritation and the shakiness in his hands and then I said, let's go back. If you go on the magnesium, that'll go away. So often you'll see individuals that start the testosterone, they'll, com they'll complain of this uneasiness or agitation or inability to sleep at night. And that's a good clue that their magnesium levels are falling. Uh, and replacing that magnesium, I in particular like to use magnesium glycinate, usually 400 to 600 milligrams in the evening. Uh, it's also appropriate to remember that magnesium, that you want to have that appropriate ratio of calcium to magnesium. Early recommendations were two to one, but one to one is more appropriate. Um, let's see. So the monoamine oxidase SNP. Um, so this single nucleotide polymorphism uh, individuals with this uh, MAO SNP uh, will have or be given testosterone and then what happens is, is they just have a complete uh, breakdown essentially uh, usually within one two three shots of, uh, uh, of having a testosterone or whether it's cream or even pellets uh, which can be even more frightening um, they'll immediately have all kinds of problems this monoamine oxidase SNP is responsible for breaking down the neurotransmitters. In particular, we're talking about norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. And it slows the degradation of these, of these neurotransmitters. This individual is um, someone that you're very familiar with. It's that warrior type personality. It's the guy or the girl who just gets things done. They always have energy. They're the ones that, um, you know,
you, you know something's wrong if they're just laying down because they're either they're either sick or they're dead. But they're the kind of people that are always moving. They're the go-getters. They're the ones that want to get things done. Um, they always have a ton of energy. They're generally very athletic. They're very accomplished people. And it's those it's those excessive levels or the slower degradation of those neurotransmitters that lead to this ability to accomplish these things. But you need to be careful with them if they are hormone deficient and you add in testosterone because very often you can start, you can precipitate uh, uh, anxiety attacks or panic attacks. Here in this, uh, uh, this is a NutraHacker report and you can see down here towards the bottom of this report um, that this individual was monoamine oxidase, uh, had the monoamine oxidase A SNP. Um, and you can see in the avoid column, I think it slides blocked out just a little bit, but at the bottom it says avoid curcumin estrogens and androgens underneath that. Um, and this test was actually run in an individual who came to me from another doctor who had started him on androgel and within a week started having profound panic attacks. Um, which was a big clue that you probably had a monoamine oxidase SNP because it happened so rapidly. So the question comes is, could you do these tests beforehand? You certainly could, uh, knowing certain personality types. Uh, when it comes to these individuals, we spend quite a bit of time in our initial intake learning about people before we ever put them on hormones to understand where they're at and uh, what their personality types are like. Because that always sets off a red flag for me if they're that type A warrior type personality that it may be a good idea then to screen for this uh, SNP uh, to prevent having those issues. Another approach with them that I'll take is that I'll take a ladder approach uh, where I'll start with either clomiphene or HCG to boost their testosterone levels. Oftentimes what you'll see is by using clomiphene or HCG that you start to bring their levels up and they still start to have these issues. Uh, the reason being that I like starting them out this way is because you can pull these medications away, HCG and clomiphene, away as a kind of a no harm, no foul. Uh, you're not going to have to worry about recovering the axis like you would if you'd put them on testosterone, so there's less impact. So often with these individuals, I'll try clomiphene first or HCG. My go-to tends to be clomiphene. Um, what I find is, is that if I start up in that clomiphene and they start getting nervous and anxious, then testosterone is just a no-go for them. Uh, what I find works best in these individuals is getting their nutrition straightened out, uh, getting them off any alcohol or medications that might be interfering, and then using progesterone in, in women, uh, oral micronized progesterone, and in men I like transdermal progesterone, uh, which, find, which I find works very well. Uh, so just remember, uh, individuals with these monoamine oxidase SNPs, uh, they have that low activity. They're more prone to anxiousness with the addition of androgens. <clears throat> uh, you'll find that these individuals do perform better on progesterone therapy. Uh, I do like my latter approach where I start with either clomiphene or HCG first to see if they'll have any reaction, uh, unwanted uh, reaction to um, of the medication. Uh, moving on to pregnenolone. So pregnenolone, uh, both a neuroactive and neurosteroid, pregnenolone being the mother of all hormones, uh, it's the first hormone directly under the influence of luteinizing hormone and is a neurosteroid and uh, neuroactive steroid with profound effects in the central nervous system. You can find pregnenolone uh, throughout the brain, but it dominates the, the, the anterior part of the brain uh, more than any other uh, part in the hippocampus. Uh, it provides substrate to increase the levels of cortisol, DHEA, and progesterone. Uh, pregnenolone is involved in the modulation of all the neurotransmitters, NMDA, uh, GABA, sigma-1, and centricolinergic systems. Uh, so what happens when you put someone on testosterone? And just to remind everyone, you know, you start them on testosterone, you are going to deplete the gonadotropins, uh, both LH and FSH are going to decrease. And we need to remember that LH stimulates 
uh, luteinizing hormone stimulates steroidogenesis by upregulating the transport of cholesterol from the outer uh, mitochondrial ring to the inner mitochondrial ring and, and does that by increasing the steroidogenic acute regulatory protein known as STAR. Uh, LH or luteinizing hormone then increases the expression of the P450 side chain cleavage which is located on the inner mitochondrial membrane and then catalyzes that central chart of cholesterol being converted into pregnenolone that this critical step is dependent on luteinizing hormone to occur. So with predictability, when you start an individual on testosterone, uh, you will see the decline in pregnenolone and DHEA over time. Does it happen to every individual? No, but you will see a decline uh, in, in the majority of them. A occasionally, though, there'll be that one individual, no matter how much testosterone we give them, their DHEA level stays fine or their pregnenolone stays fine and the DHEA goes down. So <clears throat> those are two levels that you want to monitor closely when you're delivering testosterone therapy. So just to re re reiterate, what happens to the gonadotropins when you give testosterone in any form? You suppress LH and FSH, will eventually slow the conversion of cholesterol into pregnenolone, and it's ever important metabolites. Steroidogenesis is a complex multi-enzyme process for which cholesterol is converted into these active steroid hormones, and cholesterol is directly under the influence of luteinizing hormone. Inhibition of steroidogenesis can lead to a deficiency of any and all of the hormones and the metabolites directly affecting neuronal stability and function. So what you need to remember is that when you add testosterone, you can deplete pregnenolone. And the depletion of pregnenolone and the conversion of pregnenolone into its metabolites, allopregnenolone, alloprogesterone, allopregnanolone, the collective volumes of the brain which are responsible for keeping calmness uh, uh, in the individual will be depleted as well. So it's important to remember that the depletion of pregnenolone also leads to the depletion of those important metabolites, allopregnenolone, allopregnanolone, and alloprogesterone, collectively referred to as the volumes of the brain. What other uh, hormone do we see deplete? Well, DHEA we'll see deplete as well. Uh, DHEA and DHEAS have significant command over psychological function, especially anxiety. So looking at our pathway again, the cholesterol being converted into pregnenolone, eventually moving over into the androgen arm on the right side, that depletion of DHEA that can occur with the addition of testosterone in any form. Uh, DHEA being a neuroactive and neurosteroid, uh, the dysfunctional stress response mediated by these steroids, which act locally, are synthesized in nearby cells in the central nervous system and in the peripheral glands. So DHEA and DHES are both neuroprotective. Uh, pregnenolone converting into allopregnenolone, progesterone converted into the three alpha-reduced neurosteroids, allopregnanolone, uh, which is a potent anxiolytic, and 3-alpha, 5-alpha, uh, also known as VDOC, uh, very potent anxiolytic uh, neuroactive steroids, all of which can be depleted by the addition of uh, androgens. Remember, neurosteroids are not static. Uh, they're quite dynamic under physiologic stress, meaning that they move all over the place. Uh, if more stress, they'll drop down. Neurosteroids are highly potent and dynamic uh, and control interactions within the brain and its neurocircuitry. And remember, blood levels do not reflect local tissue levels, which in uh, the central nervous system often can be eight times higher uh, than uh, peripheral tissues. Neuroactive and neurosteroids play a role in both neurodegeneration and neuroprotection in both central and peripheral nervous system tissues. So estradiol, testosterone, DHEA, progesterone, allopregnanolone, allopregnenolone, allopregesterone, DHEA, all offer protection against neurodegeneration. So these individuals, sometimes when you'll start them on testosterone, we've all heard, oh, you know, this, this person, <clears throat> uh, they have the brain fog and issues with thinking, and then you'll put them on testosterone, and then it all clears up. 
But then every once in a while, you'll get the individual that doesn't have the issues with the brain fog, but they're having trouble with um, muscle uh, uh, wasting, the sarcopenia, gaining fat around the middle, no energy to do things. And you'll start them on testosterone, but suddenly they're having all kinds of problems with mentation where they put them on the testosterone, now they're having mental dysfunction. They can't think clearly. They can't do simple math problems. And it's this issue right here that you can see this decline in the neurosteroids, the neuroactive steroids and neurosteroids that can occur from the administration of testosterone that can cause these issues. And it's those low levels of those neurosteroids that we need to get back up, which is why when you give testosterone, you're most likely going to have to add other hormones as well, like pregnenolone and DHEA, and sometimes even cortisol. Uh, remember, DHEA is synthesized both in the adrenal glands and in the brain. Um, DHEA is very important. It's neuroprotective, helps uh, neurite growth. Uh, it has antihypertensive effects, anti-inflammatory effects, helps with cognition, uh, and improves generation of myelin. So stopping the craziness. So you, you give somebody a hormone, uh, you give them testosterone, and all of a sudden the wheels come off. What do you need to have in your armamentarium, uh, in your back pocket to pull out to say, hey, these are things that I need to consider uh, I probably need to be using to help this individual. Uh, pregnenolone is going to be one of them, DHEA, magnesium, taurine, L-theanine. Uh, SSRIs and even benzodiazepines in severe cases, you may, may need to, to use those. So how do we back ourselves out of the very mess that we may have helped to create in certain individuals? Uh, you need to have as well in your back pocket the ability to uh, get or pull them out of therapy, so a post-cycle therapy, if you will. Uh, and you need to be able to use HCG, tamoxifen or clomiphene, exemestane, and astrazole, and vitamin E. And using these uh, can help you with the individual, say, for example, you've started them on testosterone. You're three months down the road. Now they start having excruciating panic attacks or anxiety or nervousness. For whatever reason, we need to now back them out of therapy and pull them out the testosterone. We, you can stop the testosterone, but now you're going to have all kinds of issues of fatigue, and inability to get out of bed in the morning and not going to be able to think. So we need to be able to take that uh, hypothalamic pituitary access and get it moving again, even if it was deficient when we started, but to get that, that access functional again. And we can do that by using a combination of these medications, the HCG, the clomiphene, and astrazole, and vitamin E. HCG, if I'm going to pull them off of testosterone therapy, I'll run that for four uh, weeks. Uh, usually daily, uh, anywhere from 300 to 500 international units a day for a four-week period. Clomiphene or tamoxifen as well, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators uh, for the anti-estrogenic effects uh, while we're backing them out of therapy. Uh, I, I tend to use a little bit more tamoxifen than clomiphene. Uh, I, f I feel in, in the patients I've had to back out of therapy, this has done a better job over the years. Uh, and Nastrozole also as well for a four-week period uh, while you're running your post-cycle therapy, uh, recovering them from taking them off testosterone therapy. And then I also add vitamin E. There's been several studies that have showed showing that uh, using vitamin E along with HCG increases the responsiveness of the production of testosterone. So I generally put uh, individuals on HCG if I'm using that as solo therapy to boost levels or in post-cycle therapy taking them off. I'll place them on 1,000 uh, units of vitamin E as well for four weeks. So you, you want to have that ability, uh, that, that tool, those tools in your back pocket so that if someone comes to you that's been on testosterone therapy and is having issues, or you start somebody on therapy and they're having issues and you need to take them off, so instead of just stopping the therapy, you want to be able to pull them away from the therapy and have that impact be less. So you want to be uh, uh, versed in the uh, use of HCG, anastrozole, uh, the vitamin E, uh, and the tamoxifen and, and or extemistane. 
uh, to help alleviate uh, coming off of therapy. So here we have an individual, and this is one of the many patients that's come to me over the years that's had, had some issues, and he came complaining of having just terrible issue, uh, episodes. Um, he's a professional male, very uh, well-known in the community, very active, uh, very athletic, um, had some buddies that were taking testosterone. He thought maybe he should be on it. He didn't really have any sexual concerns, uh, but he did feel his athletic performance was declining. Uh, but he just he was very competitive and wanted to keep up with his friends. They're very much that type A personality. We ran him through some basic tests, did his DEXA scan, which is good, VO2 test, neurocognitive function, carotid ultrasound, CIMT, uh, Venice vascular testing. Everything looked good on this guy. Major complaints just can't keep up with uh, the other men in his age group. Uh, very competitive and wanted to do so. Um, original level is not too bad. Uh, nothing really stood out that was problematic. Um, if I remember correctly, I think we started this man um, on HCG. Yep, we did. We started him on HCG 500 international units daily, and he did really well. Um, levels came up, increased energy levels, uh, but this guy actually pushed us a little bit and said, hey, I, I really want to go on testosterone. I mean, his six-week follow-up on the HCG therapy is total testosterone, 905 with a free of 24.8. And he said he was feeling better, but really wanted to be on testosterone therapy because of everything that uh, he had read about it, all his friends were on it. We had a discussion with him about it and said, hey, look at the great results we're getting with HCG, but he really wanted to be on therapy. So I said, fine, just so as you understand, these are the potential problems that can come from being on therapy. Uh, we'll go ahead and move forward, but you need to understand that there are these issues that can occur in the background. Uh, <clears throat> suddenly, the guy disappears. Don't hear from him for about eight weeks, and uh, he calls and he says, "Doc, I'm having these terrible episodes." And so we're like, "Well, what do you mean episodes? What what exactly is going on?" And these are the things that he described. They were sudden and onset. He was getting electric jolts to the chest. His blood pressure has increased. He was having daily chest pain feeling like he was going to faint, collapse, feeling like, gosh, I could die at any moment. Um, felt like somebody had poisoned him. He was flushing. He had literally had trouble walking, couldn't breathe, pounding in his chest, uh, complained of tremors in his arms, uh, leg weakness, just unable to function after starting testosterone. And he had only stayed on the testosterone for a period of about seven days. Uh, but we, we never heard from him for about two months. And these episodes occurred uh, for uh, about three, four days into therapy. And then for two to three months uh, after therapy, after he even stopped it. During this time period, he had gone to the hospital 13 times in eight weeks, uh, had been hospitalized, had gone through a myriad of different tests. He actually even ended up at one point having a right and left heart cath because of all the chest pain. Uh, so this guy got the full court press trying to understand what was going on. Uh, that is when, and I wish he would have called us sooner, but this is when you need to take a step back and ask yourself, is there something that I gave the patient that can be contributing to the problem? And this can be challenging because sometimes we all forget that maybe we gave something that's contributing to the issues, and it was. I mean, the testosterone in this man, um, his body was not going to tolerate it. So the question is, is what do you do? Well, by the time he got to us, he had already been a couple months down the road and having all these, having all these issues. So would you stop the testosterone? Well, heck yes. Obviously, something went wrong here with this man. Um, you know, we've all heard Neil say before, uh, hormones don't fix crazy. No, they don't, but they sure can cause crazy. The question is, is can you predict or? or it, when it's going to cause crazy, and that can be difficult to do. But what do you do when it does? So in this individual, you know, continuing the testosterone would be a bad idea. Could you decrease it, change the delivery method? It's a thought, but with this man, that's not something I would do. Get more tests? You could. This guy got the full court press with all kinds of tests. There was really nothing wrong with him. His particular genetics just didn't like testosterone. Uh, and he turned out to have a monoamine oxidase ASNIP, um, which contributed to these issues. Sent him to psychiatry. 
there was nothing wrong with him before the addition of the testosterone. So why would we send him to psychiatry? Uh, start an SSRI? Absolutely, you could certainly do that. Uh, we now know that testosterone depletes serotonin reuptake transporter protein, which certainly could lead to these issues. Uh, what we did with him is we did stop the testosterone, started a recovery protocol, uh, strongly you know, suspected that he had some kind of single nucleotide polymorphism, and he did. He had a COMT defect, defect a monoamine oxidase, and GAD1. Uh, we started him on Lexapro, and uh, you know, psychi the psychiatrist kind of gave me a little bit of uh, guff because we started him on the, the Lexapro, and he actually immediately said it, it worked within an hour. He felt like um, somebody had taken their foot off the gas pedal. Like whatever it was that was wrong in his body immediately stopped. And I mentioned it to the, you know, the psychiatrist that had stepped in to see him and he said, well, that's just not possible. I argued, well, the client now did get relief. He doesn't feel that, that, that pressure anymore and that, that intense anxiousness. Uh, we kept him on the SSRI for a few weeks and then slowly weaned him off uh, and, and no longer had any episodes at that point. Um, we started on the hydroxycobalamin to uh, help with the COMT, GAD1 monoamine oxidase SNPs, which will help, uh, magnesium glycinate, and then had him remove the three Gs, the gluten, glutamine, and glutamate, uh, uh, which um, can contribute to the anxiousness. What was interesting in talking to this fella is he had never been able to eat Chinese food. He said when he ate Chinese food, it gave him a nervous stomach made him feel agitated and he would have to go to the bathroom. So he never ate Chinese food, which we all know can be loaded with MSG, which is glutamate. So an interesting point that may have been helpful earlier on. <clears throat> so remember, androgens increase the binding of uh, serotonin reuptake transporter pro uh, protein, a monoamine oxidase transport protein that removes serotonin from the synaptic cleft to that presynaptic neuron. Uh, that transport of that serotonin terminates the action of serotonin and recycles it, uh, which was causing this issue in this man uh, having these episodes. <clears throat> so I'm sure that there are, are probably some questions uh, to go along with this. I'm sure many of us have run into uh, issues where we've started hormones or have been sent patients that have been on hormones, and all kinds of crazy things have happened. Rob, can I uh, interrupt for just a minute? Um, for those of you that have just joined us, please note in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you should see the question and answer box where you can enter questions for Dr. Coleman Eric. And I'll turn it back over to you, Rob. Thanks, Mary. Uh, let's see if I get some questions here. All right. Claire Green asks, will testosterone still upregulate CERT if there is significant aromatase activity as well? Um, I believe it will, Claire. So you want to be cognizant of the fact that this can happen and does happen. Let's see, I think she has a couple other questions here. Any way to get the slides? I think that uh, Mary and Dana will take care of that for you, Claire. Um, what are the citations? At the end of the... Um, Lecture, Claire, there's citations for um, all the studies that will be in the lecture. Michelle asks, what percent of patients exhibit these crazy symptoms after test testosterone supplementation in my experience? Um, I would tell you, Michelle, it seems to be about 1 in 20. Uh, and years ago, uh, and I've been delivering testosterone therapy now since 1998, um, my current practice is a uh, hormone replacement practice, um, and I've been doing this for uh, solely now for five years. While I was still doing hormones uh, in my family medicine practice, but now five years solely just doing hormones uh, in, a, in a non insurance based uh, um, uh, office. I would say it's about 1 in 20 since I started to really pay attention to this. And what I clued in on is looking at those personality types. Uh, I find that that tends to be um, a good clue is to maybe start asking questions. 
which is why I like my latter approach to delivering hormones. I like to start with either clomiphene or HCG because when their androgens go up, uh, and you can do this with DHEA as well too, when their androgen go, goes up, they'll start having issues. They'll start complaining of feeling nervous, anxious, jittery, and that's a good clue that there's, there's an issue here with them having a monoamine oxidase SNP. How much pregnenolone do I start in a man? Uh, pregnenolone, I love pregnenolone. It does a great job. I like to use pregnenolone in capsules. I'll start at 30 milligrams and go all the way to 60. Women, I generally start at 60. Um, if they're having trouble sleeping, um, where it's the insomnia that's bothering them the most, I like pregnenolone trochies. So you can deliver the pregnenolone sublingually in the evening. You'll find that like in about 30 minutes, uh, they'll feel sedated and want to go to bed. Let's get to the next one. They're kind of rolling in here fast. Um, Claire, you're welcome, Claire. George, you mentioned progesterone use in men with the monoamine oxidase SNP. What dose do you prescribe and how long do you use uh, the progesterone for? I like to use the, the, the progesterone cream. There's other ways to deliver as well, but I like progesterone cream, 100 milligrams per gram. And I start at one click uh, a day, and, and then I go from there. I just start slow and work my way up. I usually find one to two clicks a day will do the trick. For the next question here, uh, Marsha, let's see. Ask, uh, I am a woman on HRT. I'm unable to tolerate pregnenolone, even though I feel great on it. After a few days, I'm unable to sleep. I would love to be able to tolerate. Any suggestions on EP? You know, it's very interesting. Most people get sedation from pregnenolone, uh, but uh, every once in a while, I get somebody that feels like they get insomnia from it. One of the things that I would try, Marsha, is if you're doing the capsules, try sublingual pregnenolone, uh, sublingual pregnenolone trochee, and just see what happens. The other thing you could try is um, GABA flow spray from Apex Energetics. GABA flow spray from Apex Energetics. You might find that that would work well for you. It's uh, sublingual uh, taurine and L-theanine. Uh, Claire, you're welcome. This is Robert. Can you back off testosterone in a person who, oh, lost the question, has been on it for several years? So can you back off testosterone in a person who has been on it for several years? The answer to that is yes. Uh, you'd want to run a recovery protocol. So you want to use uh, the HCG, the clomiphene, um, uh, uh, the anastrozole and the vitamin E, I would use them each for four weeks uh, and then stop that therapy and um, recheck your laboratory and see where you're at. Let's see. See, Dolores, um, how do you test your patient's T levels? I do everything uh, a liquid chromatography tandem mass spectroscopy. Hey, Greg, is there a way to stop this from scrolling like this? Yeah, because they're rolling in and I can't get. Uh... Hey, Rob, there should be a box. Yep. That has a little arrow that'll make the box bigger. Did you see that? Yeah, it's staying the same size. It's just the, the questions are rolling in. And it's kicking me off the question I'm trying, oh, to, I trying see, to read. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm having to scroll back to find the question. Um, let's see. How do you test your T levels? Okay. Martin, uh, the focus, most of this lecture has to do with uh, testosterone placement in men. Can it happen in women? Yes, it certainly can. Uh, that we don't see the gonadotropins fall off like we do in men. Um, can you review the three hormones that help with anxiety? Yes, uh, Jeff, those are allopregnenolone, allopregnanolone, and allopogesterone. The way to get those levels to go up is to give the individual either pregnenolone 
or progesterone. Pregnenolone, I like to deliver uh, either orally with the sublingual trochees or with the capsules. Uh, and then progesterone, I like to deliver by um, cream for men and capsules for women. Uh, that's how you can get allopregnenolone, allopregnenolone, and allopregesterone to elevate. Uh, what lab do I use for the uh, single nucleotide polymorphism testing? Um, the ones I was using for that were NutraHacker to get that report. Uh, there's another one you can use. Um, the name escapes me. It'll come back to me in a minute. Um, Doctor's Data has a test that you can use as well, Doctor's Data, uh, which is a, 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 a simple uh, blood stick. Let's see. Uh, Shiri, so it's my understanding that you cannot use testosterone for enhancing, I lost it, where'd it go, athletic ability, it's frowned upon by the medical board, the test was treated, was treated only for that reason, no, he was treated for other reasons, he had some other complaints, um, uh, that individual wanted to use testosterone, he felt it was going to help him, uh, with his issues that he was having with the muscle loss and muscle wasting and gaining fat around the middle. Um, that is true. You don't want to use testosterone or any of the anabolics solely for bodybuilding purposes. Let's see. Um, let's see. What would you, what would be your approach if a woman has similar symptoms to a male patient? Uh, my approach would be the same. It would be to back off of therapy and I would use either pregnenolone or progesterone. Uh, generally what I do with progesterone is I up the dosage. Um, uh, if, if they're on 100, go to 200, 300, and that usually will take care of the issue. And then you can also add pregnenolone to that as well. Let's see. Ask what time of day. Uh, I take it what time of day you give the pregnenolone. I like to give it in the evening. Could you see, Jessica, could you foresee these terrible episodes occurring in a, a bodybuilder who has decided to discontinue competition? Prep, oral, high testosterone, for two months, it has been dosed. Um, you can see these in any, in any individual, man or woman. You can see these symptoms coming in any man or woman, uh, regardless of any level of testosterone. It always seems to happen. It's just been in my experience. It always happens to the individual who probably needs the treatment the most, who has terrible uh, uh, symptoms of hypogonadism. And they're the ones that need the therapy, and even the smallest doses will set them off. They'll just have terrible panic attacks. You'll be giving them uh, you know, 0 0.1 cc's every other day, and they, they still have terrible panic attacks. And it's really a shame uh, when they do. It's, it always seems to be the individuals that need the therapy the most. Uh, Benjamin, will DHEA replacement trigger these symptoms in similar fashion? I have seen it, but not as often, so yes. Uh, Joanne asked, do you, can you use estriol or estradiol rather than tamoxifen? I suppose you could, but it's not something I've used, done before. I, I prefer using tamoxifen when I'm using a post-cycle therapy to get them off the testosterone. Martin, this has happened to me once in 10 years, and it happened in a woman on low-dose TRT. It can happen at any dosage of testosterone. Um, and it's hard to know what somebody has in their genetic makeup or what genetic variant that they have that can cause these issues, but they certainly can and do happen at any, at any age and at any dosage. Uh, Michelle, do you have an upper age limit to start the HCG or Clomid to be able to see an increase in test? No, I don't, Michelle. Um, I use Clomid more than I use any other uh, medication. Uh, it's easy to use. It's easy to back away from. And you can see remarkable responses uh, in an individual at any age. Um, matter of fact, I was just talking to somebody about a client that I have that's 69 and on uh, 25 milligrams of clomiphene every other day, we're seeing testosterone levels over 1,000 with threes in the mid-20s, uh, which, which is fantastic. Uh, Jeff, if a monoamine oxidase issue is present, do you ultimately avoid androgens altogether? 
Um, no, but I make them aware of the potential issues that could happen. Um, and it's these crazy unwanted side effects that we don't want that they need to know about. Uh, not too dissimilar from dealing with individuals that have uh, thrombophilia hypofibrinolysis. They can use uh, androgens, estrogens, uh, uh, but they need to be aware of the potential issues that could uh, could show up, but often don't. Uh, ask progesterone, see Michelle, ask progesterone cream dosing for men, why not use oral progesterone in men? You can, I just prefer creams. Uh, Martin, what levels of progesterone do you look for? I don't usually look for a level, I look for alleviation of the symptoms. And you'll find that men that have monoamine oxidase SNPs, um, uh, usually the, 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 uh, um, uh, these individuals will respond well to progesterone cream. I like to start at 25 milligrams a day and I let them stay there for a little bit and that generally will, will solve the problem. Every once in a while I have to go to 50. Uh, George Rice, uh, in the recovery protocol, are you using multiple treatments at the same time like HCG with clomiphene? I am. They're taking it daily for four weeks. HCG, clomiphene, and nastrozole daily for four weeks. Um, Allison, what level of L-theanine do you recommend for when, men and women? Uh, I like the sublingual sprays to get it delivered right away because generally when these individuals have uh, a panic attack or they're feeling anxious or tense or nervous, you want to get it in the system uh, immediately. So my preference is the GABA flow spray from Apex Energetics. I'm not pushing them. I just I I like that product. It uh, I think it has about 30 milligrams of L-theanine and four milligrams of taurine in it, and uh, I think B6. Uh, and I have them do three full pumps under the tongue, hold it in their mouth for a minute, and then swallow it. Uh, Michelle, uh, you say you use both HCG and clomiphene on your ladder approach start in your recovery pro protocols. Uh, on my ladder approach, I use HCG and or clomiphene. Sometimes I do both. Uh, I prefer to use clomiphene first. It's just very simple uh, to use. Uh, it doesn't require an injection, so it's, it's easy to use that way. Some men think that you know when you're when you're using therapies if they're not taking a shot it's not going to work so sometimes I'll start with HCG but I do prefer clomiphene over HCG uh, Jeff do you see similar issues with progesterone therapy um, any hormone can cause any crazy symptom in any man or woman um, so I have seen progesterone do some strange things to women so when a patient tells you I took X hormone and something crazy happened, I would believe them every time. So I think that, you know, we've come a long way in the last 20 years with hormone therapy, but I think there's a lot more for us to learn and know. I think the next 20 years is going to be really interesting and things that we know now probably might not be true in, in 20 years. So, but yes, I've seen progesterone do some strange things to women. Um, Jessica, is Clomid 25 milligrams every other day your typical regimen? Um, I start with what the studies show, which is Clomiphene 25 milligrams every third day. Uh, but I found over the years that usually every other day works best, and in some men, every day works best. But I generally start at 25 milligrams every other day. Uh, Julie, what is the highest dose of Clomid you can use? I have a 24-year-old man on 50 milligrams with a free of 19 who's still symptomatic. I'm trying to get this level higher. Um, document, document, document with this. I've used clomiphene, uh, usually 50 milligrams every day. You could try going to 100 with him, um, but every once in a while, and I've got a, right now a 22-year-old um, who has been on um, psychotropic medication since he was 12, and his hypothalamic pituitary axis is practically non-functional, and he's just clomiphene resistant. It's just not going anywhere. So we've moved from clomiphene to HCG. So I wouldn't hesitate if this 24-year-old man on 50 milligrams daily, I would move him over to HCG and see how you do with the HCG. And I would start at 500 international units daily uh, and go from there, Julie. Um, and if that just fails to do it, just document, 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 and don't be afraid to move to testosterone. Like I said, I've got uh, you know a young 22-year-old who's been on psychotropic medications for several years and has just 
you know, it's, it's, just, it's just not functioning, and we had to put them on testosterone. Um, just document. Claire, do you find uh, those with monoamine oxidase SNPs could potentially do better if they avoid foods? Mm, that's a tough one because that takes a lot of discipline. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. M maybe, maybe. Aaron, uh, what is the incidence of these issues in TRT? Um, I would say it's about 1 in 20 in my experience over the last 20 years, and I've really paid attention to this over the last five years. Uh, so I would say it's about 1 in 20 individuals, and I've gotten better at identifying who you might see these in. As a general rule, within the first three months of therapy, of replacement, testosterone replacement therapy, I generally have them backfilling with pregnenolone, DHEA, and magnesium. So whenever you add testosterone, you should be thinking that they're going to need to be taking magnesium, DHEA, and pregnenolone. And if they're still having crazy episodes, it's going to be because of that depletion of serotonin reuptake transporter protein, uh, which you may have to use a um, SSRI to, to help with that. Let's see, Dolores, uh, to clarify, when you said P4, 100 milligrams per day, one click, yes, that's correct, one click daily. Yes, 25 milligrams. Uh, I think that closes out all the questions. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody's questions. Thank you so much for uh, spending uh, time with us this afternoon. I hope this information uh, can help you. I know we'll delve probably further into this, uh, that part five hormones with Dana coming up in the fall. Um, I'd encourage you, all of you, if you haven't taken all of Neil's courses, uh, they're fabulous courses, uh, parts one through four. Five is a great one as well, and I'll be excited to be lecturing at that one uh, this fall. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to you, Mary, Dana, and uh, look forward to talking to all of you again. Thank you very much, Rob. WorldLink maintains an active subscription-based service to EBSCO host a third-party aggregate of thousands of medical journals. Please consider supporting the service and join for $350 per year. We'll provide access to Medline as well as folders for articles presented in these webinars and workshop courses. Information can be found under the membership tab on the World League Medical website. I want to thank Dr. Robert, Robert Komenarek today. I hope our listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. Our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, June 13th. Archive versions for all webinars can be found on the website under Resources and Webinar Library. There is always new information coming out. Think about attending a refresher training if you haven't been in a while. If you're new to WorldLink Medical, we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you again, Dr. Komenarek, and everyone who joined us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.